Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the 12 Talk podcast. Now, usually it'd be me, just me and Mitch, but I've kept Charlie on the screen anyway. Here's our guest for tonight. Uh, this is Charlie Wilson. Uh, he is the NFL writer for the Daily Mirror and the Daily Express. Correct. I'm right there, and I, yeah, I got it right. Brilliant. I have been mentioning a, uh, a rival through a lot of things today, and I've had to really, really, yeah, I know. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I've had to really sort of clean that up. Um, but yeah, so we're going to go through today Charlie's draft prospects for the Seahawks. Obviously, we've got our own. We've discussed them. Mitch has got a few. I've got a few. We're then also going to talk about some mock drafts. So it's mock draft season. Why not? Charlie's got a full first round mock. He's got a Seahawks mock. And then I've got my, what I've dubbed, the Josh's value mock. Um, before we go any further, I just want to like to, say, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who's been tuning in, whether you've been listening, whether you've been watching. Please make sure you like, subscribe, hit that notification bell as well on YouTube. Or if you're listening via a podcast platform, do the exact same thing. We really appreciate it. And if you do like what we do and you want to give us a treat, by all means, buy us a coffee or a beer. We record late here in the UK, but if we do record with any of our American guests, they might be very early. So a coffee would be well needed. Uh, and for anyone who is admiring my my lovely hoodie here this was a custom job and yes it is the boz i know people have got strong feelings but i thought it was a fantastic cult figure and i would have 100 percent had a boz haircut if i was around when he was um this is from at mugs nfl you can find him on twitter also online at custom buy mugs.com they're absolutely fantastic the customer service and the quality is just brilliant hit them up but before we go any further, gentlemen, are you ready to get into this? Absolutely. Let's Let's go. I'm, uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. Uh, uh, draft season is um, it's fun, right? You know, last season for the Seahawks wasn't, wasn't very fun, but now we can look forward to a new era in Seattle and um, potentially a whole new group of players coming to a team. So I'm looking forward to it, Josh. Excellent. Right. Let's hit that theme music and then we'll get into it. We're back. I, I'm not going to, you know, rinse right, rinse lyrical about that. I still love our theme tune. I can't help it. That is <laughs> that is a really good theme tune. That. Uh, that I've seen I've seen some good ones. That might be that might be up there. That might be uh, up there. That that is uh so that's Slim Genix. You can find him on SoundCloud. It is a slight bit of nepotism on my behalf because he is my brother. Um, <laughs> but when you turn to, when you turn around to your brother who you knows a music producer and DJ and say, this is what I need, and he sends this to you in the first cut, you think, it's got to be used. So, yeah, thank you very much. I'll, I'll let him know. Hopefully he's watching. If not, I'll make sure I send him the clip. But here we go. Hot Prospects is what the episode's called. Who are we picking? Who should we look after? Who, we sh who should everyone look out for in Seahawks land? Charlie, you are our guest. This is for you to take the lead on. And then, by all means, Mitch and I will chime in with anyone that we think as well. So, if you're asking me who the Seahawks should be targeting, is the best player that they can get, right? They have to see how the board falls to them um, in the first round. And Matt, in my opinion, they have to trade back. Um, not having that second round pick is huge, especially in this draft. I love the depth this year, especially uh, in the trenches where Seahawks need the most help. Yep. So I'm trading back all day long, and I still think – so I'm trading back just to confirm in the later first round, and I still think the player who is the most ideal for them at 16 will probably be there in the mid-20s. So to answer your question, I'm going to trade back. I'm going to take the best lineman who I can get. Oh, my guy, which actually leads in <laughs> very well to uh, a question that we received through our Discord from Ryan G., he just said, 
say if we have pick 16, but you like me trade back, I, I see so much value in this draft for the positions that we need that I always trade back. I have one trade partner that I go to every time in the Detroit Lions because I think they're going to look to build off last season and the higher they can get in the draft, the better. We can get a, a late first and a second from them. But he said, say you have pick 16, you're taking D-line or O-line versus Latu, Murphy versus you know JPG, Power Johnson or Power Jackson um, and uh, or Fuaga or Fatani. I forgot to read for a second there. Cool. Yeah. So that, that answers the question. We're gonna go lineman that first that first round. In that first round, obviously, I have your first round mock, which we'll be showing people later. But what prospects, if we're looking at D line or O line, would you want us to look at, Charlie? I mean, on those six on the list, it's difficult. I don't think if you, I don't think Fuag is going to be there. I think he's going to be taken tenth by the Jets. I might be very surprised if he falls below the Jets. Um, Leatu Latu, I also think will probably be taken by then. I love him as an edge rusher, um, but I'm targeting two guys in particular, and that's Troy Fatanu, and who actually is not on my list is a, a, d- a defensive tackle um, who I think have a best two fits for Seattle late in the first round. And we obviously need help interior because we've got basically no interior offensive <laughs> lineman apart from Olu Olu. Um, so we need as much help as we can get there. Um, Fatanu is obviously a guy from, from Washington who played so well as a left tackle. Um, but projects as a guard. He will play guard, no question about it. And obviously our new offensive line coach coached him. So I imagine C- Seahawks will be targeting him. But like you say, Josh, I've not. I've not mocked him to Seattle. I've actually passed on him and uh, drafted someone who's not on that list of six players. I saw. And uh, yeah, that, I, I was surprised with the the list that was there. I mean, Latu for me is is a as a rugby man as well. His transition from playing rugby to American football, I find fantastic. Mitch and I, over the last couple of episodes and over Messenger and Discord and everything, have been desperately trying to find out what he did to his neck. Now, I can only imagine it's cervical spine, obviously the neck. Um, I don't know if it's spinal cord or or what's happened. But for him to be told to never play again, I can only assume it's spinal cord. Do you know anything, Charlie? Please enlighten us. I don't know the injury exactly. That's no one that. does. <laughs> all, yeah, all, I, all I do know is that there's a lot of talk about he he retired, right? Like, are you retired? So there's, there's concerns about his love for the game. That's not... Um, we spoke to someone in Washington who was on that stuff. He was he didn't retire. He was told he probably can't play anymore and then got second opinion. It's like, you can play, and he jumped at it. So it's not like he was like, you can't question his love for the game or... Um, even listen, his injury was obviously quite significant if he was told to retire, right? But he's found a way back and he looks every bit of a player, if not better, since that injury. And so I can't help you about what the injury was. All I can tell you was it doesn't seem to be affecting him at all. And Josh, you know a lot about about next than I do. Um about neck injury, should I say. <laughs> It doesn't look to be effect. I don't want to not being horrible. You just you know. <laughs> well, it's, it, it, it was my injury. I paralyzed myself with a spinal cord injury. That's why, as soon as I saw this, when Mitch and I were going through Latu, and he highlighted that neck injury, I I did such a deep dive online to try and find something, anything, and it just says neck. And you're thinking, you, you hear the term broken neck a lot, right? But we heard mm-hmm. that with DK. We've heard that with Latu, but they're not. It's not just like it's a bone and it breaks and it doesn't, right? It's like there's different. There's a lot of different injuries you can have. Um, so I don't know any, any specifics, but he seems to pass every medical you can right now. So he seems to be okay. And I'm not a doctor, so I'll just go with, with what I'm told. <laughs> so the doctors have said he's fine to play, so that, that's the main thing then. I'll trust I think him. one of the things that helps Latu is that a lot of his success off the edge hasn't been built on being overly bendy or athletic. It's all technical ability and skill and motor. So even if he is slightly inhibited by stiffness in a couple of vertebrae, you know, it it clearly isn't stopping him right now being able to ply his trade and do it really well and secure a projection for a top half uh, of, of, of the first round pick. So, um, if he's passing medicals and he's performing like that just just after that um uh, that injury and having two years like he did with so many sacks and TFLs, 
I don't think there's going to be a huge amount of concern, which is reflected with the projection, I think, in the first round. Just so, just to I'm echo off of that, Mitch. So, sorry to interrupt, Josh. Like if you if you're a pass rusher and you're like and you're trying to learn how to pass rush, watch Leatu Latu. He is not athletic. Obviously, he's athletic, but he's not an af- he's not a pure athlete. He wins, like like Mitch says, by pure technique and understanding of the game. And it's beautiful to watch that like, the way he rushes the passer mm-hmm. is is so refined and so skillful. Every step, every movement is calculated, and, and it's it's good to watch. I would say my my favorite thing from watching this tape was it, it was his his the movement of his feet. The placement of his feet to set the rest of his body and the mechanics to get around a tackle or a pass the guard, I thought was absolutely fantastic. And that, that's it excites me. I'm I'm gonna hate seeing him in another team's uniform, but I'm excited to see his career trajectory. Now yeah. you you said that you were gonna look at O Lyman. Um you mentioned that, and there's a D lineman that isn't on that list that was given to us by Ryan, but we'll get to that one later. Um so if that's going to be your first round, we're going to be looking at O line or D line. Is there anyone else that say the Seahawks didn't go O line or D line that you think we should look at? That's that's me. Yes, yes, Charlie. Yeah, so I was trying to pick your second, brains. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> in the second, what are you on here for? <laughs> in the second round, I, I've I was mocked to the tight end, um, and I would not have done that last week. The combine is a reflection of that. Um, they obviously need need tight ends because again we have none. We just let Will Disley go, Colby and Noah Fant are free agents. I don't think they'll re-sign Noah Fant. Colby Parkinson maybe, but even if they do, they still need Noah tight end, maybe even two. So that's a position of need. Linebacker is a big one, a big position of need, which I do think they will address. Um, there's, there's one guy in the draft who Seahawks Twitter are pining for, and I, I agree, he's a good player, Junior Colson. Um, and then safety, right? Safety. Now we just let go of um, the two expensive leaders on the team. Um, expensive the, safety tandem in the NFL. Yeah, who um, yeah, produce a little bit, but not as much as uh, Seahawks Twitter. <laughs> I mean, just to touch on that a little bit, I'm, Conrad Diggs, good, sa- good safety. Yeah. Not worth the price. Jamal Adams, good safety. Not worth the price. I don't know how you can disagree with the moves that the Seattle have made. I think they're I, tr- I think they're good moves in my opinion. Um so so to answer your question again, Josh, safety is a is a need. I, I completely agree. I mean I'm I'm fortunate enough to be on garden leave at the moment. So my day is spent looking through Seahawks Twitter and YouTube videos and everything. I'm I'm seeing the 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 polarizing effect it's had with this safety group. Obviously we've now seen Quandre Diggs, as you've mentioned as well, Adams, Disley, and we know Monet is now gone, um, which Mitch, I'll let you touch on sort of the cap implication of that very shortly as well. But I, I don't see why there's such a, a sort of discourse around the release of these safeties. The cap that they were commanding and the production they were giving, like Quandre, fair enough, wasn't ever present. Suspect tackling last year, which really, I really, really ground my gears. Um, but in coverage, you can't fault him. He was a leader. People liked him. Adams wanted to be that leader, but was never around and just become, just become, became, excellent English from me there, um, became a bit of a liability sort of on social media and around the, the complex. And he just didn't justify that. I saw something from Mike Dugar earlier where there's this whole thing about um, the clear out that John Schneider's doing and, the fact that it's partly him to blame. I agree he is a part of it, but then a lot of these players that you see who got the big contracts were definitely peak guys. Adams, Diggs, you know, and this isn't a slight on Diggs because I think he's a fantastic character. Disley, um, Monet is gone for a reason, but he's clearing these out because that's just a cap it we can't keep on board for the production we're getting. Uh, speaking about cap it, so Mitch, you, you, you're our stats and figures guy. Anyone that watches or listens regularly will know this. So what are we looking at now with our, our available cap? Sure. So I, I will I will do that. But you just mentioned about uh, Twitter, uh, or was it Mike Dugar talking about um, Adams being one of the worst 
John Schneider trades or be at a problem mm-hmm. that he'd created. I actually think on the flip side of that, Quandre Diggs is one of the best value trades that that John. So you've released two safeties in one day with the same problem of them taking up too much cap, but you've got one guy who's massively overachieved. On a, was it a fourth rounder we traded for Diggs to the fourth or fifth. Fifth, 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 yeah. fifth? There you go. Even better than I thought. Versus a guy we traded two firsts for and has play, played like one and a half seasons <laughs> worth of football for us. So it's it's a very dramatic contrast between the two. Um, but yeah, referring to cap, we're, we're now about 40 million. Or we're projected as having 40 million available to mm-hmm. use um, going into free agent frenzy. So that's really well timed. Um, but some of the numbers that have been banded around and, you know, it's often a lot of it's clickbait anyway. They're trying to get you to click the article by by giving you an inflated figure. Um, I'm sure Charlie, Charlie knows all about it um, <laughs> <laughs> with his industry. But yeah. Um, there's there's been some numbers with with Adams and with Monet that are slightly off, I think, and there's a few things to consider. So, with Monet, it's 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 widely said it's under six, just under six million worth of cap relief, but he hasn't passed a medical in order to be removed from injured reserve. So there will be a compensation awarded to Monet. So possibly we'll see more like four or closer to four million than just under six with him. Um, and regarding Adams, he finished the year on injured reserve. I think the last three games of the year, it could be four, he was on injured reserve. And he has also yet um, to pass a medical. If he's to sign with another team this season and passes a medical there, there won't be any compensation due from us for cutting him because he's fit to play. But that isn't the case with Monet. So Adams should be six million as we've cut him immediately to realise that sixteen rather than the sixteen sorry, the six rather than the sixteen that would have been post June if we'd cut him. We've taken that money now um to free it for free agency, I think, which has been, I think, the approach from John with the roster yep. to try and free up that money now rather than waiting for Monet to get better and pass a medical, cut him now, take the compensation hit, get the money available now so we can compete for the names that we need to fill the roster pre-draft. That looks to be the sort of chain of, uh, of sort of preparation and, and actions taken. So um, we're looking far better. 40 million is better than the, the, the minus five that it was three, four weeks ago. Um, but there are obvious holes on our roster and a, a, more than you can address with, with a single draft. Um, so a lot's for us to talk about over the next few weeks with the, free agency stuff and uh, and draft and then this is the thing that all these the mock drafts that we do at the moment are all pre free agency which i'm acutely aware of um the the mock that i'll be showing later you can listen to my thought process in the podcast and video about that tomorrow when it's released but i will always caveat this until free agency starts that this is pure speculation because we don't know who we're going to sign in free agency what gaps in the roster are going to be filled but this is where we have people like charlie in the know who is going to be able to tell us where we should be looking anyway to pad out the roster with some really good talent Uh, we've been through it ad nauseum now and it's just nice to have another voice in here who's going to be able to tell us exactly what they think one thing i wanted to ask you charlie as well looking at these first rounds you had o-line or d-line Knowing what Mike Mike does with his defense and how he likes a versatile tool, if Cooper de Jean fell to us, would that be something you'd consider if you were a GM? Would it be something I, as a, if I was GM, knowing that Mike McDonald is my head coach, yeah, I would consider it. Um, I think he's gone before then. Um, he is, <laughs> I see a lot of um, people like, oh, is he a cornerback? Is he a safety? Like we don't know where it working. He can he can play all, all cornerback positions and all safety positions. Mm-hmm. That is, there's some positions where versatility isn't good because it means you're a master of nothing and good at everything. That's not the case with Cooper DeGene. He can play every position in defensive back and play it well. And Mike McDonald defense in particular is predicates around disguise and who's lined up where and what can you do. Cooper DeGene is the perfect. Mike McDonald defensive back. So I would consider him. Um, I don't think he'll be there, but if he drops, sure, why not? It's not our biggest need, not even close. Mm-hmm. But you have, I think you have to consider it, sure. sure. Mm-hmm. When when unicorn-type players 
And by that, I mean just rare. Like Kyle Hamilton was exactly like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, when they fall, you just have to take them. Um, and he's one of those. He's in that category, in my opinion. I've I've, I've seen where you've uh, you've mocked him to as well, and it's uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's on scary on to Cooper, think about them. on Cooper De Jean, I would I would say this as well that with the way our roster is currently, you're looking at paying um, with a spoon big big money, and it, mm-hmm. if you draft another defensive back. We may well end up in four or five years' time in a not not quite Jamal Adams and Dig situation production wise because those two could be absolutely masterful on the back end and justify any money they're paid. But it would put us in another lopsided cap situation where yeah. we wish we had some money for the D line or we wish we had money somewhere else. So it would make sense to offset that balance for the cap and go D line maybe or O line and spread that round where we're putting our first round picks. Um, that's kind of similar with the Bengals. What they're so they right now are unsure whether to pay T Higgins or not because they've got Jamar Chase who's going to get that money. So it's like, how much money can you put into the tag team, haven't they? Did they, they have, yeah, yeah. Tag him, yeah. They have, but they probably were going to extend him, is what the is what mm. the noise is. And if you do that, you're taking money away from another position. Will does Seattle want to do that on defensive backs? Maybe I don't think it's the best move personally. Um, I, I think I think it's getting to, and you see this now with all of the veteran safeties that are commanding a lot of cap that are being cut. I think teams are now looking at having some sort of parity across a way across a salary because you don't want to be paying a certain group an exponential amount taking up so much of your salary cap that then you're left with the dregs with the rest. I think there needs to be a line in the sand where you go, look, these are the band-ins. We can't overpay regardless of Pro Bowls, Super Bowls, personal accolades. This is what we need for the team. And you either like it or lump it. And I think there's going to be quite a difficult free agency period for some people. Joe asked uh, on X, are we talk about taking DeGene at 16th? That it theoretically that was a possibility. Obviously, Charlie has got his preference, and you'll see it in his mock later. Um, and I've got a preference as well. We know Mitch has got a preference, and when Mitch releases his personal mock draft as well, I'm intrigued to see that one as well. So that was first first round. So you said second round, Charlie. Who did you when it, for you trading back? What would you be looking at? And what give us a couple of players that you'd possibly look at. Okay, so if we're talking about taking a defensive lineman in the first round, is that what we're going off or we're going off taking offensive linemen? The, uh, offensive or defensive? You've named a couple, but okay, you can give, so, us, give us a couple of players if they're available. So so what else? Okay, so I have I have us mocked a tight end. Do you want me to talk about that? No, we'll say, save that. Save, okay. We'll you, go to you. that one later. <laughs> got you. So, yeah, just to see who you look out for as a Seahawks fit yeah. prospect wise in the second. If we were picking there, who would stand out to you? Who would you want the most if we were picking got there? Got you, got yeah. you. So I think there's um some edge players you can look at. There's also in my McDonald's defense, he wants a pure nose tackle. Um, Michael Pierce on the Ravens is exactly that. He's just a guy who's gonna two gap, he's gonna take up two two gaps and just basically just put his body in way and say, try run through the A gap, try it. Um, Tavondre Sweat is a player who I think can do that perfectly in Seattle's defense. We've given you a little bit of pass rush upside as well, and to have that from Nose is extremely rare. He's 370 pounds, so he won't play every snap. He 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 might play 50% of the snaps, which lowers his value down. But I think Nose is a position to look at. Um, defensive tackle, obviously, like, like we've just mentioned, there's a few guys um, in that group. You've got to look out for um, edge. Like I say, there's there's a lot of players I like who I think will go in the first. Was uh, Chop Robinson from Penn State, who is now seen as a first round pick. Um, PFF have him as a late second round pick. I, I can't Weird. understand that for I can't understand that for the life of me. But I have seen other um, thought of analysts who feel like he might go in the second round because of his length and his. People say he can't play against the run. I disagree. I think he can really well. Um, again, safety. Safety is probably value-wise where second round is really good. I love Tyler Newman from, from Minnesota. Um, I think he's a first-round safety. I would absolutely target him in, in the second round. Um, yeah, linebacker junior Colson. Love him. Love, love, love his tape. Edgar Cooper. 
bit of a will linebacker, speedy, gets around, love his tape. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of Zach Zinta, the guard from Michigan. There's a lot of, uh, there's so much depth in the second round that it's hard to name one player. Um, if if I'm naming one player in that second round that I think would be brilliant for us to pick up, say we've traded back out of the first round or we've traded back to the back end of the first round and we picked up like a late second maybe, Cooper Beebe is is a guy that I absolutely love from Kansas. He is a really versatile piece. He could he could play back up if if Lucas misses the start of the season. He's a guy you can play there. He can play center. He can play guard. He's a, he's renowned for being a team leader as well, and he's barely given up any pressures and sacks in his in his career. And he's he's played a lot of games, so there's a huge amount of tape there, and he looks so polished and ready to go. Um, if we were picking there and we took BB, I'd I'd absolutely um, I'd be fine with it. Funny thing about BB as well, his dad his dad played um, offensive line and tight end, I think as well. And his two brothers, uh, one of them currently, I think Camden uh, Camden BB is currently on the Kansas roster, and his his other brother didn't get in at Kansas because they have someone else playing the same position. So they nearly had three BBs at Kansas following on from his dad, who is now one of the administrators for the football team. So it's a real Kansas, Kansas theme there. <laughs> Maybe the chiefs or getting lifts in together. Why not ride share? You know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Take a minibus for all the BBs. <laughs> he's he's stop. one of those. He's like a pure, pure left guard. Give a BB. He's, he's so, he's so dominant in the run game. He's big. He's, he has some flaws. His kick step, isn't, his footwork isn't very clean sometimes. He kind of gets caught off balance. But he's one of those guys, Mitch, like, like you mentioned, he's just going to be good, maybe really good for a long time. And I think with our second round pick, we have to find someone. Whoever it is in second round, he has to be a starter, right? Mm-hmm. We, we all agree. BB is a starter. Yeah, I think he represents great value for a late second if he's there and we're picking as well. Someone who's going to come in, fill an exact need, NFL ready, a bit of versatility there, um, and that kind of family pedigree of 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 playing, you know, playing the sport to a high level. His his dad actually won uh, in his first season playing offensive line for Kansas. He won um, all pro honors for the best lineman in the country at college as well. In his first year, reverting from from tight end, so um, they've had an impact on on that that college. You know, some with... good stock, isn't it as well? Yeah, um, it's good stock exactly. Yeah, just just very quick surprise. as well. Three BBs is a great band name. Personally, I just call them the BBs <laughs> and get them all to grow a beard and try and sing as high pitched as possible. Get them wearing tight trousers and doing <laughs> funny, funny dances. <laughs> Charlie, one thing we haven't mentioned as well, obviously, with you being a journalist and a lead NFL writer, you've actually got a draft guide coming out soon, haven't you? Yeah, I do. It's going to be out sometime next week. I've just finished it today. So. Hopefully the graphics team will make it look nice and shiny. That's not really my job, you know. I just I just do the writing. They do all the fancy work. Um, so yeah, I finished that today. Um, that's it's twelve thousand words, seventy five prospects in depth, and then two hundred and fifty more where I think they will go with notes on them. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. It's uh, it's been a long labor of work, but it's been um, it's it's been good to write. So, like, labor of love. I mean, Mitch has uh, started his own draft guide, which he's he's determined to get it done it looked fantastic i used it for a lot of my mocks it, it, i know it's a work in progress but that next season for definite that is going to be out yeah for sure i think i think my problem with my draft guide is i've tried to include so many prospects and try to make it so um user friendly i've tried to sort of uh, create icons for traits and incorporate them in like the stat packs for each player and so you can see at a glance you know, what sort of quarterback they are, what kind of edge rusher they are, you know, and it it's very much a sort of conceptual uh, framework for something that I think can work. But mm-hmm. as I look at other people's um, guides, I think I, I'm pulling so much more information out of theirs. But again, like like you said, you've, you've gone in-depth on 75 players that are going to make their name coming out of this draft. I've gone capture all the information for as many prospects <laughs> that are going to get taken you know there's a lot of guys on mine that I've I've done so much profiling into that are likely to be undrafted free agents yes 
So I, I've made that mistake before. I um, there was a tackle from Arizona State. I can't remember his name now. Two years ago, and I wrote like five five hundred words in him. He didn't even. He was ne- he never even got picked up by a team. So it's like I, I'm never doing this again. Like I'll just do seventy five. That's my limit, and I'll do notes on another hundred or so. Well, as, as soon as your your draft guide comes out, and we're going to lean on that knowledge very shortly for the rest of the rounds before we get onto our mocks. As soon as that comes out feel feel free you can tag us and that we'll happily share that for you because we'll you. we'll look upon that and we will use that when it comes to our our draft party so we'll we'll be hosting that on our discord as well we'll be having a live watch and uh, we could all react in real time um but as we've gone through the first and second charlie hit us with some of the other rounds and some of your favorite prospects for the seahawks so the later rounds is so we're talking rounds four, five, six, seven, right? Okay, so I think if you're not going to draft a quarterback in the first three, I think you have to you have to look at quarterback. I think they're going to. I, the way John Schneider talks about not drafting a quarterback is like it's like some sort of illness that he has. Like he has to mention every interview that he's drafted two quarterbacks in 13 years. It's like a sickness that so he just he just has to get it out. Between um, that, so and, that and mentioning that he was told at Green Bay to always draft the quarterback every single yeah, draft. Yeah. Was it Ron Wolf? Is it? Yeah, he mentioned. Yeah, every time. Um, so I think they have to draft a quarterback. I'm not in love with many of the late round quarterbacks. If I have to, I guess Joe Milton um, from Tennessee. But my gosh, his his performance at the combine was like your. He looked two years away from being two years away. He looks like. A fish out of water. Um, I see it with the traits, but he's not ready. Um, I've been really high on Spencer Rattler for a long time. For, to me, he's a second round draft pick. He might fall to the fourth or fifth. And if he does, go get him. He, he yeah. could be a starting quarterback. Even this year, his tape, um, the way he played with that offensive line, he looks like, he looks like, you know when you're on Apple Music and you, you've not got the premium version yet, you've got to have a free trial on it. It's not as good. Like there's not as many things you can do and you can't skip. That's like Spencer Rattle with Patrick Mahomes. He he's got aspects of it that are good, but he's not premium version yet. He's like a, a free trial. Patrick Mahomes is Spencer Rattler. So I would take I would take him every day, all day long in the third or fourth round. Um, after on, that, on Spencer on Spencer Rattler. Before we move, before we move, um, I. I really don't want to like him because of the because of the TV series yeah. where he he looked like your typical like egotistical kid in college that you just would hate and I think his experience throughout college where he was behind Caleb Williams he made all his mistakes at, at um uh the Sooners you know he he flashed all of the traits to be brilliant and had boneheaded moments where he'd make he'd he'd back himself to do the impossible and lose his his college games you know the games that he would often lose he'd be replaced because he'd be do, making mistakes that he's done a lot of times i think his his kind of knock the knock on effect of moving through different colleges and different situations based on him damaging his stock might really have knocked a lot of that ego off him and he does seem to have improved more in his last couple of years of college than he did at any other point. So it might well be that he he sort of realized he wasn't as close to being a, uh, good enough as, as he thought he was when he entered college. Yeah. Does that ring true with you? If you watch his interviews, Mitch, and I'm, I'm sure you probably have, he is, it's like a different person. He, he comes across as such a, a I've, I played American football at a way lower level than college football. <laughs> But I've played with a few quarterbacks in my life, and the ones you want to play for are the leaders and who um, have got an aura about them, the way they speak, the way they put the team on their back. Spencer Rattler has that. He didn't in Oklahoma. He was a bit of a um, a bit of an idiot. He, he was. He'll say it himself. Um, he's grown up massively, and he's turned into a leader. And like you say, Mitch, he knows that he's probably on his last chance. Um mm. And he took that in his stride. He went to a struggling team with a bad offensive line, like really bad. Never moaned about the poor protection that he had. Just kept grinding out, getting hit, hit, get back up. It was the Gamecocks he finished up at, wasn't it? South Carolina Gamecocks. Yes, South Carolina, yeah. South yeah. Carolina Gamecocks. He, and he was, he was great. This, this past year, I think 68% completion. Had the worst O-line in, in college. Like, that's really impressive. 
and to me, he's someone who you take a flyer on yeah. all day. Mm-hmm. Second round, in my opinion. I, I agree. I, I I I got a lot of flack for this, but I I rate him after the TV show, much like Mitch said. I think he he didn't come across well. He came across like a spoiled brat, rich kid. You know, entitled. I'm QB one. I'm going to go here. I'm going to be fantastic. But then he got humbled. And as we just as we said in the comments, he's he's finally started to show some maturity now as well. And I think that is really going to alert a lot of these the, the scouts when they have interviews with him, and they'll actually get that from him and think actually our perception is is a few years old now, and you've actually grown up. So Rattler's bun to watch. I'm, I'm with you on that. What else have you got for us, Charlie? Safety-wise, we've not taken one yet. So there's a kid at Oregon State called Keaton Oladipo who's just good at everything. And I've only watched a few of his games, but I, I can't find bad tape. Like He just he's looks... What I like to do when I'm watching college football, like a random college football games, is just go in with no preconceived notions and just watch and who jumps off the page. And it's him every single time. He just jumps up, he's making plays, getting around the field, hitting hard. He and he's predicted to be a seventh round pick. Like, he looks great. Like he's the kind of player who can come in and have at least have a Jarek Reed kind of role, right? Mm-hmm. Where he's going to make plays on special teams and potentially give you upside as a strong safety or free safety. Um, and I guess one Quandre- more top that. Well, I'm sorry, I was going to say Quandre Diggs 2.0 is what I call Jarek Reed. I yeah, think he's maybe. He, he, just just everything about him just screams Quandre, but I think Jarrett Reed hits harder. Yeah, yeah, slightly more athletic Jarrett Reed as well. He's he's a bit sort of nippier and uh, less less stocky, a bit of a wire, more of a wiry build and a bit quicker. But he does throw himself around like a torpedo, like like we've seen Diggs do for years. And uh, I like that kind of um, commitment to 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 that, like throwing himself in. Come on, give us I a couple more, Charlie, and then we'll go into the mocks. Okay, but so the kid, I can't remember his name. The tight end at Washington, who I've seen the seventh round, we've mo- been mocked him quite a few times. Is it Westover? Yes, Westover. Um, that's Jack right. Westover. Jack Westover. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He he reminds me of um, Jacob Hollister, where he will give you very minimum as a blocker, but he will he will be a red zone threat even from year one, and he, he might be, he might be a free agent. Undrafted free agent. He um runs really smooth routes. He's quick. He knows how to get he gets in out of his breaks well. Um I like him as a late round flight, and I think he could give us especially with Colby Parkinson, who's developed quite significantly as a blocker, he could be be a perfect match with Colby Parkinson in most two tight end sets. Um I also like Malik Washington, the wide receiver from Virginia, I believe. Yes, um, a fantastic shrine ball. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, yeah. He he's just one of those guys who, not the quickest, not the most athletic, but he finds the pockets. He knows how to run his routes, and he sits there. He'll take a hit. He's like a poor man's Tyler Lockett in a sense. <laughs> he's got nice hands as well. I thought some of the catches he Good made hands. in the bowl, I thought were fantastic. He just took it in stride. There was no way that was escaping his grip. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm a big fan of that, that as well. Before before we go to Marks, just like to point out that. When when Tyler Lockett's being paid twenty seven million, almost any wide receiver is a poor man's Tyler Lockett. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, anyway, That's a good point. Before we get onto the mocks, so just just one more comment that we didn't get to. I mean, Joe on X, he said we need so much help on the uh, on the line on both sides. It would be insane not to go that way. And funny you mentioned that, Joe, because we have got the uh, the mocks. So this is Charlie's first round mark. Charlie, talk us through it because we're going to try and keep this pod to under an hour. So you've got 20 minutes, my friend, to go through this, your Seahawks one, and then my one. So the first thing I realised is that there's a mistake and Byron Murphy's in there twice. So I need to, I need to change that. Byron Murphy has been... He's got a twin, hasn't he? I heard he's got a twin with the same name. Like copied and pasted this from what you there said must, me must well. be two of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's my mistake. I apologize. Um, it's one of many. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I do. I have to do mocks quite a lot for work. So I've just I do them all the time. Apologies, um, twelve talk podcast listeners. Apologies, but <laughs> obviously we're here for Seattle. We're Seahawks fans. So I'll talk about. Is it well? Is it, he calls himself Johnny Newton? So I guess I'll call him Johnny. His name is Jason Newton. Um, he's just the best interior. Sorry, Josh. I was going to say for for anyone who is listening. Um, by all means, come and watch the YouTube video. We've got the, the graphic up here. 
And this gives you Charlie's insight into where he thinks every prospect's going to go in that first round. Byron Newton's that good. Oh, By <coughs> Byron Newton? No, try again. <coughs> oh, God. Byron Murphy's that good that he's going twice. So <laughs> we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll let him correct that and we'll, we'll pop it the on the Texans, socials for you. The Texans will pick him and Cardinals will go, no, we, we want him, we want him. <laughs> well, yeah, but so, let's, so for this one then, let's go on to your Seahawks side of it. So everyone's seen this first round. So anyone who's watching on YouTube can see that. Uh, I'll put the recording of this out as well straight after we've recorded this or we've gone live. So you can go back, you can pause it, and by all means, interact with Charlie. You can see his uh, his X handle there is... At, it's at Charlie Reach PLC. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Abuse or not, uh, maybe not abuse. We, we try. We try and keep that <laughs> to a minimum. Oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> Good northerner. All right. But uh, let's go into your Seahawks, Mark, because I thought this was fantastic. Yeah. So, so Johnny Newton is is the guy for me. Um, if it took him at 16, that's that's fine. I would just rather get a second round pick, and I think they can. Um, I think he probably will fall. He, he might not, who knows, like it's it's a month and a half away. But he's just a player who, you know, he's big. He can play all three downs. He lives in the backfield. He just, like every play you watch, it's like he wins. Single team, double team. He like swerves his way through. He's like, it's like he plays with like slime on his body and he just finds his way, a way to get around his block. And like, how did you get through that block? But he does it, man. He does it. He, he shakes, what he's explosive through the it's gap. It's uh, hilarious he's, you said that because he reminded when you said that it, it's reminded me of Adama Traore, the football player for for Wolverhampton. Well, you coated in Vaseline. He used to yeah, he used to cover himself in Vaseline so people couldn't hold him because he was that sort of big and physical. He'd beat you, and the only way you could stop him was holding on to him. So he'd grease up before the games. Similar similar to Johnny Newton in that respect. You don't you don't stop him. He wins every time. I agree. And it's it's just. And it's not that he wins with speed as well. He has technique. The way he he hand fights is really impressive, especially for the interior. Like his technique alone, even if he wasn't explosive, which he is, his golf is fantastic. It would be wow. Okay, he's he's a prospect. He reminds me of Ed Oliver from the Buffalo Bills, who mm. was compared to Aaron Donald quite a lot. Johnny Newton is not Aaron Donald because because no one is. Um, but yeah, he could be Ed Oliver. He could be like. A, not not close to Darren Donald, but the same kind of player where he's just going to be a game record on the defensive line. And wh when is the last time that Seahawks have had a player on the defensive line who you have to account for and be like, how do we stop this guy? How do we stop number four? Because Newton is that guy. I'm happy with that. I agree. And you, and you, the last player that we had that was like that was probably Michael Bennett, where mm. we, we put him in mm. situations to win because he was such a handful, move him around the line and make the teams have to account for him at different points and with different personnel constantly. That That's the kind of player we're talking about with Johnny Newton for me. And, and just to clarify for anyone that's going to listen to this, so our pick 16, Charlie traded with the Eagles to get 22 and then pick 50. So who do we have at 50, Correct. Charlie? So before the combine, I had a third round draft third round grade on Theo Johnson and I thought yeah I'm way higher than other people I, I've seen him in the fifth round sixth round fourth round but watching his combine good lord he is a not just a freak of an athlete he he is like one of the best athletes that we've seen in the last decade he is quick he's six six he jumps out of the building I think he's had the highest broad jump and vertical jump at the time position has seen in like 20 years. Um, and I went back and watched his tape and it shows up. He had seven touchdowns on like 350 yards because Penn State's offense wasn't, wasn't very good uh, passing the ball. But watching him score touchdowns, like he's, he's just a red zone monster. Um, as a blocker, he has work to do, but he's going to be a touchdown machine in the league, and I think he might even go earlier than this. Um, he's a player who I think we have to consider. It's again, it's not the most the biggest position of need. We need offensive line more at this point. But if he's there, I do think that they'll consider him. And the, the big reason why is the I think they're going to build an offense similar to the Ravens, where you've got Mark Andrews as, as that move tight end, and Fear Johnson can can be in that role almost to a T. Nice. And then explain the uh, the next sort of trade-up for us and how you got there. 
So I think around this point is where Edgar and Cooper will go, who's a linebacker mm-hmm. from Texas A&M, Texas, I believe. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Um, and the only other linebacker who I think is worth taking around this point will be Junior Colson, the Mike Backer from Michigan. And he's going to be a guy who the Seahawks love. Um, flies around the field, obviously played Mike McDonald's defense for Michigan. Um, he does everything well. He comes, he's great in coverage. He's fast, he's 6'3, he's 250. Doesn't look it, but he's big, big guy. Um, He's just technically sound. The only thing I don't like about his game is he plays linebacker like, how do I put it? <laughs> when So I coach um, some first years at university. And when you teach them how to shed blocks in in training, they'll be great. You know, they'll, they'll put their hands on each bit, they'll shed the block. When it gets to a game, all I'll do is just, it's just run at offensive linemen and try to knock them off their feet. Junior Colson kind of does that where the tech, he just kind of, I'm stronger than you. I'm going to push you out of the way. But well, you can't really do that in the NFL. But his aggression, his want to, his build will allow him to make plays all over the field. And I have no concern about him being a very, very good linebacker. And at this point in the draft, I think it's worth trading up for. Maybe give up a, their fourth round pick all day. I'm, I'm with you. I'm a big Colson fan. So, yeah, 100% on that one. And uh, then... You addressed our O line. Yes. So obviously, when you get to, I mean, uh, this point of the draft, if this is how it goes, a lot of Seahawks fans will be nervous. It's a third round pick. We've not got, got an interior lineman, and rightly so. And this is in the hope that Zach Zinter falls to this point because he could go in the second. He's just a real technically sound guard. Um, you can plug him in, and I don't think he'll ever be all pro, pro ball. I just think he'll be really sound technically a sort of Damian Lewis level guard. And I think for the draft for the for a third round draft pick for the money he'll be paid, I think it is well worth it. And he's a plug in play starter. So I think you've got to take him. Yeah. And then we've got the next three, which you've already alluded to. <laughs> yeah. My apologies. <laughs> I've, all, I've already spoken. I, 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 I thought I was blowing his load before we get to it. But now I, I think you, you explained those perfectly. Washington, we, we went through that fantastic option there, especially when we're going to look to beef up our wide receiver room. We don't know what's going to happen. We lock it. Will it be restructured? I don't think they'll release him. I think there might be a restructure, but then you'll need to start building up behind him. Oladipo, as you said, Oregon State, he's a great shout there. And then Jack Westover. My only apprehension with Westover, and I've looked at him throughout a lot of my mocks, is I think he'll be a UDFA purely because he wasn't used a lot in grub system. So people won't have the tape on him. They'll be able to see the physicals, the testing at pro days and whatnot. But I don't think that's going to be enough to get him into the seventh. Um, apart from that, I I love that as a mock for, for the Seahawks, mate. It, you can tell you're a professional at this. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my thing, thank you. My thing with Westover is I was watching, I was trying to find other tight ends around listed sixth and seventh rounds and I don't like any of them like they're all just oh okay. you spoil my mock mitch <laughs> <laughs> um there's not i couldn't really find a tight end that um i i i, I think there's some good blocking tight ends where I, okay sure um but i think she also going to want another red zone threat especially if tyler lockett he will retire or leave Seahawks in a few years. They have to look for another um, touchdown score and West Ham has the, the, the potential um, to grow into that role. And then we had sort of one question come up again from, from one of our regular viewers, listeners and members of the Discord. Um, just talking about the tight ends that you've drafted too. Um, spoiler, I have two as well. Just saying it's the thought on this that we don't bring back our current tight ends. Yes, sir. Noah Fan is going to cost a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, you look, I, I think Noah Fan might get twelve million a year. Um, I wouldn't pay that personally. I like Noah Fan, and, and I think you can probably he probably in group system, group system, should I say, he will be a lot better. I imagine. I don't think he's worth twelve million. Um, Colby Parkinson will probably get half of that. I absolutely would pay that. Um, his upside as a blocker really impressed me because he was a ter- he wasn't he was not a good blocker before he got into the league. No. Um, 
He wasn't a clean blocker, should I say? He's impressed, especially in the open field. He's he's quick, um, good hands. I think Cole Paxton is worth six million a year all day long. So I would pay Colby, but even if you do pay Colby, you still need two more tight ends. Agreed. And and this brings me quite nicely onto mine. Um, now I just want to caveat again. I did this on mock draft database. Um, the picks won't be as realistic as Charlie's, but using a draft simulator, you take what you give him. So if we're looking at this, so much like Charlie, I'm a big fan of trading back. I think there's so much value and you need that second round pick. And as I said, my main partner, whenever I do these is the Lions, because I think they're going to look to get some premium talent to build off their success this year. So I traded my 16th, the 29th and 61. At 29, and this, I don't think this will happen in any realistic environment but i took brock bowers because he was sat there and i could have gone really hyper realistic but if a player like that is sat there at that pick you take him you run to the podium and you say i'll have it that is just a weapon that can be used in grub system um and then straight after at 61 junior colson he is for me he's my consensus he's, he's my my preferred linebacker now obviously i know there are others that we've discussed as well that showed out of the combine but i think colson in in this system with mike mack will just excel um and then the next one you'll have to forgive me because i don't know how many <laughs> row rows i put in it but it's at 78 i picked rook or is that right i think that's so. probably quite yeah. good Bosh, there we go i'm getting it um from clemson just to put that hole in the D line. I, I think, think is, it a, is it not is it not a horror horror? No, well, on the or, 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 they, they corrected someone and said it's actually a row row row, and I I remarked that it was sounded a lot like a junkyard dog, um, <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, no, apparently it is a row row row. So and if they, if we get a junkyard <laughs> dog on our D line to come into that <laughs> rotation, if we can resign Big Cat. I think Draymond Jones, Mike Mack will be will look at him and think I can use you. Um, keep Reed as well as long as he's doing what he's doing. I'd be happy with that. Plug a row a row in there as well on that rotation, and I think that first year you'll just sort of see him start to creep in, get used to the nuances of going against an NFL O line, and then the production will start coming. And then at pick eighty one, I addressed tackle, and I went and. I'd like to thank Mitch for this because I've been pronouncing it wrong for so long. It's Kieran Amagaji, the tackle from Yale. He was sat is there. That, and... Is that how you would pronounce it, Charlie? Just just checking. I, I'm I was certain it was it was Amagaji or Amigaji. Correct. Amaga Amagaji yeah. is yeah. I'll, I saw an interview with him, and that is that is correct. Perfect. But again, perfect projects. He can play right and left tackle. Plugs those holes. Um, and then when I got beyond this pick and I got to pick 119, I had two players that I really wanted. They were both sat there. I had James Williams, the safety linebacker cornerback from the U, who Mitch and I have spoken about before, who I think would be a fantastic tool. And as Charlie said, Mike Max defense is all about disguise. You won't know where he's actually going to be lining up. And then my next one was Sione Vaki. And it was a coin toss between these two. On my on the, the next on the draft part I do tomorrow, you'll hear all about it. I, I probably spent a good 30 seconds deliberating. But luckily for me, when it got to pick 151, the Bills came in and said, let's do a trade. So I went, okay, I'll get some more draft capital. They traded 159 and 202 to me. And I thought, Vaki is gone. That is my my other safety, who I think will be a development special team and then come into the team. But he was still sat there, and I could not not take him. I think he's going to be such a fantastic player, sort of going through all of this. And he's something that we spoke about highly on the pod. Looking to see, looking forward to his development, and he just brings all these intangibles. But it's such a such a sparse safety room as well. I thought it's something that needed to be addressed. My next one, I had a toss-up between, I can't remember who the old lineman was, from Michigan and Brandon Coleman. And I went with Coleman. For anyone who doesn't know, 
Coleman was a team captain at TCU. He had 11 starts. He had seven at left tackle, four at left guard last year. And he allowed one sack in 723 snaps. Now, that is the type of versatility I, versatility I want on our, our O line. If we can plug him in at tackle, but he's also more than competent at guard, that is perfect based on our injury concerns. Um, and the next one is one that Mitch loves. It's a tight end that I found in the later rounds, AJ Barner. Not the flashiest of players, um, but I will take his 22. Uh, he's not 22 at the moment. Um, so he had 22 receptions last year, only 249 yards, but that's still an average of 11.3. He only had one touchdown. But for a man that has got the potential, can play a fantastic blocking game as well, I'll take that because I think we're probably going to sign one of our tight ends back in free agency. I personally would like to see Parkinson because, as you said, Charlie, I think his development has just skyrocketed since we signed him, for, since we drafted him from Stanford. Um but yeah, that, I've, I've picked Barner there. And then my final pick, 233, a gentleman that I'll admit the name intrigued me to start with. And then I saw his combine and I was impressed. Really impressed by his, just the, the physical traits that he showed that would be easy for a coach to develop. And that's the thing that our coaching team are really focusing on the teaching element, which is what we've lacked for the last couple of seasons. So I've gone for Jalix. Hunt, or it may be Jalix Hunt. Jalix. The edge, from, there you go, from Houston Baptist. Um, late, it's the last pick of, for us in the draft. You can have him on the practice squad. You can have him on special teams. Let him develop, and then let him just come along there. But there you go. That was my value mock. Go on, boys, very quickly. What do you think? Go on, Charlie, I'll start with you, and then I'll wait for Mitch's character assassination. Solid. You addressed all the needs. Um, I think some of the late round players are just eh, okay. Wouldn't really excite me, but uh, Vaki is is a player who um, can provide starting upside. The others, I'm not so sure. But yeah, as as long as we address the needs and you don't reach too hard, which you haven't, um, I'm fine with that. Um, they have to they have to come out of this draft with. Three or four starting caliber players, and I think you you did that in your draft, so ah, that's all good. I'll, I'll take it, Mitch. Go on, one minute, go for it. <laughs> one, one minute to break it down. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll quickly touch on AJ Barner because he's he's someone I really like. He's he's a guy they relied on a lot in their run game, which obviously Michigan were. They they did it so well that they won him a national championship. When they did when they did target him, he was you know he had, he was productive with you know you, you've mentioned over 10 yards on average when when targeted um and i think in a, he was underutilized in a run heavy scheme we know he could come in and aid our run game and we know we've got a, a, a running back one who likes to bounce outside um so that immediately is a nice support for his his game um and you never know how good his ceiling could be on um, his receiving game because it's not been tapped into. There's no tape on that. There's untold upside with AJ Barner that late. And when you're picking a, a tight end that late with that frame, the absolute bottom line for him is you've got your inline tight end who's going to solidify the end of that line, uh, be a brilliant blocker, and you can develop him into something else. And you're not going to be paying him for five years or four years because you've taken him so late. I, if we have to take multiple tight ends, he re represents superb value. I, Big fan of Barna. Even I'm with if, that, go on, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, we're getting to the hour mark. We want to keep it under an hour. Charlie, before we go, tell people where they can find you, when your, your draft guide's coming out, and then we will uh, we'll make sure we share everything. No, good, yeah. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. Um, so, Charlie Reach PLC on, on Twitter. Um, I work for a Daily Mirror. Actually, we're, actually, it's for the US team. So the Daily Mirror in the UK have, have now expanded into the US. So that's a team I work for. Nice. So I'm the NFL writer. Um, yeah, all my things you you can find on Twitter. All my stories. My draft guide will be released next week, Monday or Tuesday. Looking forward to that. And then, um, yeah, preparing for the draft. Perfect. Well, Charlie, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, 
for everyone that's tuned in, who's watched, who's commented, thank you so much. Don't forget, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, all that good stuff. You can find us on pretty much every source of social media. And until next time, I'm just going to say, go Hawks. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. Thank you.